Yeah. All right. We're pretty settled in now and uh, eating food, so we should go ahead and get started. It's 10 after the hour. Um, first of all, thank you for coming. We've got a pretty good turnout, I think. Uh, and I'm excited about some lightning talks. Um, so first, this is obviously the first meetup of the group. Um, so maybe I should just speak a little bit about why I started this meetup. Um, I attend other, several meetup groups in the area, and it's you know they're great talks. Um, but sometimes my favorite part is really the lightning talks because anyone can stand up and just spend a few minutes talking about something cool they've been working on, something cool they learned about recently, whatever. Um, and I went to PyCon last year and attended some of the lightning talk sessions there, and it's like rapid fire. You get a lot of information about a lot of cool stuff that people are working on, and I think, you know, I had a feeling that that might draw more people. It's not language specific. It's not just Python. It's not just Go. It's not just X Y Z technology, um, and that's sort of my thinking behind it. And a couple of guys that I follow on Twitter based in Chicago, created a meetup group called Chicago Open Source Open Mic. And I saw that and I was like, and it was all about you talk based. When I saw that, I was like, oh, this is awesome. I wish I was in Chicago, or I could just create it here. <laughs> so here we are. Um, again, welcome. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time up here talking about anything, but I do want to go over a few ground rules for the talks, uh, just to, so we're all on the same page. Um, you should, if you're giving a talk, try to target about five minutes. But keep in mind, you can cover a lot in five minutes. Um, you use your time wisely. Um, but some topics might deserve a little more time. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying let's have a hard limit at about the 10 minute mark. And I'm actually going to have a timer up there on that screen in the back. Um, <laughs> just mainly as a tool to help the speakers know where they're at and how much time they got. Not so much for bringing the hammer down on people. Um, also, the idea is to kind of spark conversation. So definitely after the talks, if you if you saw a talk that was interesting to you, go up and find the speaker and talk to them more about it. Topics. Um, it's called open source, open mic. So it should be at least loosely associated with open source. But that can really mean anything. If you wrote some code and you put it up on GitHub, talk about it. If there's some library or API you use that's open and it's documented, talk about it. Um, processes, even, or tools. Um, we're not too, I'm not too worried about how you can tie it back to open source. Um, so, pretty open. Questions. Uh, if you do have questions, just I'm okay with uh, having people answer questions, um, but wait until the end of, the, of their five minutes or 10 minutes, um, and try to make sure that it's relevant to other people in the room, not something too specific to your own, your own project or whatever. That's not gonna, yeah. But again, just to reiterate, talk offline after the talk. And hopefully we'll have fun. The idea is everyone can share something if you want, learn lots of things from lots of different people, and eat and drink. Have a good time. Who do we talk about the food? Translate. These are the Translope, this is the Translope office. I work at Translope, a few of the people in the room work here, um, so welcome. And that's that. So, there was a sign-up sheet if you plan on giving a talk. You don't have to be on the sign-up sheet. Um, and it's not necessarily going to go in order. But, and also, if you have slides to show, you can email them to me. Or you can use your own computer. It's just about streamlining the process. Yeah. All 
All right, let's start. How about Neil? Sure. Awesome. Neil is going to talk about open source and education looks like. Yeah. Do you have any slides or anything, or is it just talking? I don't have any slides. All right, that's fine. So. Uh, I just thought <clears throat> what I'd do so is let me know when the timer's starting. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, great, thanks. So I am Neil Caden, and um, what I thought I'd do is just uh, tell you a little bit about what I do, and then if there's interest in mingling or talking a little bit more, we can do that, or if there's interest in a future topic that I might be able to you know, bring to the, to the group, then I can do that. I am the uh, Sakai Community Coordinator, and, the, and Sakai is a learning management system, so it's open source. Um, so I don't know if you've ever heard of Blackboard, uh, Canvas Instructor, I'm seeing some heads nodding. So it's along those lines, it's a learning management system. It's used by probably three to 500 institutions worldwide. We can definitively have identified recently about 160 of them. Um, so millions of students affected by it. And, uh, and it's a worldwide community. Um, and uh, so that's, you know, that's what I do. And, and it's under the Aperio Foundation. So the Aperio Foundation was a combination of Sakai. Sakai used to have its own foundation. And then there was JSIG, which, which a number of other open source projects that were education related, and they merged and formed Aperio. So um, the Aperio Foundation has in its portfolio things like CAS, which is an authentication software that's, uh, that's also used worldwide. It has something called Xerti, which is out of University of Nottingham in the UK, which is um, to develop learning content. It has uh, Matterhorn, which is um, streaming media software. Uh, so just all kinds of uh, you know really cool software that's out there. So I guess I'll take a couple minutes to talk maybe about Sakai since that's the community I manage. But again, this is just sort of to introduce myself, to say hello, um, and then if there's other topics of interest, you can let me know for, for some other time. Um, so Sakai started in 2000, around 2004. It was a consortium of institutions. It was MIT, Indiana University, um, Stanford, um, University of Michigan, um, Foothills Community College in California. I think there was one more California college. And they got together to say, at the time, really Blackboard was like the only big beast in town. And they said, well, why don't we do this ourselves and then we can better meet the needs of our students and our faculty because we know what their needs are better rather than having vendor lock-in and being dependent upon a commercial proprietary system. So that's kind of how it started about 10 years ago. And since then, it's evolved. The membership has, has kind of turned over. Um, we're about, right now, we're working one of our biggest releases. From what I hear from community members who have been part of the community for a long, long time, we're, the, the release we're working on right now, right now, Sakai 11, is maybe the biggest release since the beginning of Sakai because we're doing things like responsive design so that it can work on different types of uh, platforms and mobile devices and iPads and that sort of thing. And, and we're redoing the gradebook and making it slicker and trying to get the interface uh, to be nicer. And within the community, we're trying to figure out how we can be a little more sustainable. So that's a really interesting, I think, aspect of open source is, you know, how do you build community? How do you make it sustainable? Uh, how do you compete? And what does competition really mean in terms of open source versus um, commercial um, offerings? So that's kind of my thing. That's my introduction. Um, if anyone has any questions, I've got two minutes. I can answer and go in particular uh, in any area. Sakai is spelled how? Sakai is spelled S-A-K-A-I. And it's Sakai Project, so if you go to www.sakaiproject.org, that's our website, and Aperio is A-P-E-R-E-O. And the way it got Sakai, I'll just, uh, well, I'm looking for hands, so you can raise other hands, but I'll fill in a little time while, uh, if anyone has a question, is that um, they decided to base it off University of Michigan's system, which is called Chef. And so then they were, you know, had to come up with a new name with the system, and Iron Chef, Iron Chef Sakai was one of the most famous chefs, and so they named it Sakai. And at one of the board meetings, uh, Chef Sakai actually like sent over like little pudding things or something to the board. <laughs> so you know, so that was kind of cool. that Chef Sakai knew that we named our software after, uh, uh, you know, in honor of him. Any other questions? Okay. Well, yeah. So, so your employees are all distributed. So I'm the only I'm the only person who works for the Aperio Foundation. And so everything else is we have an ecosystem of, of pirate institutions and also commercial affiliates. So all of the work, so, you know, it's, just, it's distributed among you know myself and people who are volunteers. You know, as people who work at. I know I should mention also that Sakai is used a lot locally. So um, Duke University uses Sakai, UNC Chapel Hill, Wake Forest University. So we have a really in Durham Tech. So we have a really strong uh, Sakai presence. But to answer your question, it's uh, you know it's really an ecosystem. 
if there's developers or documenters, bug checkers, what are you looking for in order to help further the project? That's a great question. I have 20 seconds, so <laughs> that's a really great question. Um, yeah, we really need um, all of the above, and that would be a, maybe a good you know discussion either for for another time or uh, to um, you know to have like offline kind of conversations. I'd say the number one thing, one of the big things we're going to need is QA testers coming into Sakai Lab. We're going to need a ton of QA testers to have that you know development cycle go quickly. You have like the ten minutes. If oh, yeah. Okay. Well, if there's other questions I can answer, but feel free to use the hook and, and pull me off otherwise. But <laughs> my five minutes is up. But. Um. <coughs> So I'm interested in, in the funding model. Yeah. Because um, I actually was at Indiana at the time that Sakai was being started, and I know there was a lot of controversy about the model where the universities all kicked in a certain amount of money and, and tried to build it together. But now that you're yeah. expanding, how is that working out? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. So the, the, it's the, fun, the funding model question. So when it started out, it got a Mellon grant, and that's how it got initial funding. And then like Indiana and University of Michigan um, and some others, you know, threw a lot of developers at it. They're now lo no longer part of the community. They left for various reasons, which is a whole, that would take me another 10, 15 minutes easily. But so now the funding model in terms of like what funds me is we have a membership, but it's totally optional, right? So we don't, we don't discriminate against institutions in terms of how we treat them who are parts of the community. But what we ask is, hey, to be sustainable, you know, we try and have a funding model to become memberships of the Aperio Foundation, and then a slice of that is sort of that, over, part of that overhead is, is me. But then in terms of funding other things, um, that's a whole other discussion. Like we're trying to figure out in the community how we fund big <coughs> projects, right? We, we've had some um, real good success lately at funding about a half a dozen small projects to move um, Sakai forward. Like I mentioned, we have this really nifty grade book, and that was through a funding effort that came out of New York University that got some other institutions involved. Um, and then on the other hand, we still have a lot of um, independent uh, things going on. Like Morpheus, our responsive design project, really came out of community members, not out of funding. So we're still struggling with that, and we're trying to, uh, we have a big Sakai camp in Orlando, Florida at the end of this month, and that's gonna be one of our topics, is like, you know, what's our big vision, and how in the heck are we gonna you know, fund it or get resources for it? Any other questions? Good, all right, cool. So feel free to talk to me. It's a pleasure to be here. Nice to meet you. Okay, cool. Computer numeric control, not important. What a CNC tool is, is it's a machine that takes as its input raw material and a software program and produces as its output a manufactured product. The most common ubiquitous CNC tool I could think of was a laser printer, which we don't think of as like a manufacturing machine, but it is. You give it a stack of paper, you give it a toner cartridge, and you give it a postscript file, which is really a postscript is a stack-based programming language, if you look it up. <coughs> Uh, and that which tells printers what to do, and it produces as its output a manufactured page, which is kind of like, yeah, so what, who cares? Um, but 3D printers, which people have been talking about a lot more lately, is like, whoa, it's got this wow factor, and you can make little plastic parts with them. Who has a 3D printer or has seen 3D printers? I mean, people have been exposed to that at least. Uh, 3D printer is the same thing. You have plastic <clears throat> filament and a G-code program as its input. G-code is kind of like the postscript of 3D printing or of other types of CNC. And as its output, it produces a little plastic figurine. Um, <laughs> there, are, there are a bunch of different types of CNC tools that are, that are used in industry. And pretty much everything that you, make, you have that's a manufactured product is made with CNC at some step of its design process. CNC mills, which are used for cutting uh, metal and plastic, hard materials, silicates, ceramics, uh, wood, things like that. Lathes, which do the same thing, but they do it in kind of a rotational fashion. And these are all doing basically the same thing, where they're taking a computer program and running it to produce some physical thing. Uh, water jet cutters, which are really cool, that tr turn you know programs into uh, uh, pieces that are come out of really hard materials or cuts that are difficult to make otherwise. 
Uh, sewing machines, you give it fabric and a G-code program and it turns, turns that into a sewn part or and fabric cutters. Uh, plotters, uh, you give it a pen and a G-code program and it prints kind of the same way a laser printer does but completely different. Uh, wire benders, oh this one's cool. Total waste of time, however. There we go. So running a program to do wire bent parts. There's a lot of things that are in, uh, I mean, look at the back of your kegerator. You've got a little rail that goes around the outside that was made on a CNC wire bender probably. Um, Conventional CNC hardware is large and expensive and single purpose, which makes it like kind of like capital expense. It's things that cost tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars to install. So you, you get your board of directors to approve, you find funding, you buy a machine to put into your factory. Um, because of that, conventional CNC software is monolithic, it's highly specialized. It's expensive and it's closed source, which makes us sad because we're open source people and we like open source stuff. So, however, things are changing a little bit. Uh, CNC is becoming cheaper, smaller, more accessible, easier to kind of digest for people like you and me who maybe don't have a big factory but want to make things. Like this jackass. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is the handy bot. The tool's right behind me. It's a portable CNC mill. So this is like kind of like that big CNC mill that you would buy and invest in and sit in the corner, but it's portable. You bring it to the material and you set it on top of the material that it works on and it cuts things out. This is the Shaper digital hand router, which is a basically like this, but it's a hand tool and it's actually got a little screen you can see on top of here and it guides you. Like you, you go and cut material with this and it guides you and it actually has uh, three degrees of freedom where it takes the router bit and corrects. So like if you're crappy at it and you like kind of like do it like this, it will actually fix that real time. This is the Red Ant portable laser cutter, which is a portable thing that you just basically sit down and you fold out this arm and then it can do laser cutting on whatever material you set it on. Um, the next generation of CNC hardware is less expensive, it's smaller, it's kind of more multi-purpose. Um, and it's open source. A lot of these things, including this tool, are open source. They're like, you can go and download the plans for this online. They're not online yet, but the previous generation of this, they're up on GitHub. Um, so, the next generation of CNC software needs to be extendable, interoperable, it needs to have better network support, it needs to be more generalized so it runs on different tools. There's actually, basically what I'm here is to advertise a vacuum of cool software that, that like now is a need for that there wasn't before. This is one of these rare situations where this open hardware has kind of outpaced the open software. And there really aren't a whole lot of good solutions for CNC software that's open source. Um, the way that the project that I'm working on, which is called Fabmo, uh, envisioned CNC being kind of more app-centric and more network-centric. So these machines that like typically had sat in a corner and they had a dedicated computer, and it was like the kind of the computer priest model where you'd like take a stack of punch cards and like walk it to the machine, and it was like a lot of work to generate the files. That's kind of going away. It's not going away entirely, but it's moving towards things that are more app-centric. This is a power tool that you can bring to the work and so you end up in a situation where it's better um, to be able to like, I wanna be able to cut a hole with this. I wanna be able to do small tasks. And so there are small softwares, which typically we call apps for doing it. So this is a couple of screenshots from this project that I've been working on, which is called Fabmo. Um, this is the dashboard. This is software that runs on the tool that you connect to it with a web browser. And it's kind of like a platform agnostic way of driving this type of tool, not just the handy bot, but <coughs> perhaps that laser cutter other tools that are similar um, can all run this software and basically provide a platform for people to write apps that are in web language type things, JavaScript, CoffeeScript, whatever you know is your favorite thing for the web, and they run on the tool. It's mobile first, which, you know, mobile stuff, that's all fun. <laughs> and um, it supports conventional workflows, which is, you know, you write this program, this is a G-code program, which is what is typically drives these things like this, CNC mills and printers and things. Um, but it also supports apps. So these, this is an app that I wrote for it called Terrain Man, which is uh, for cutting these kind of uh, programmatically generated <coughs> surfaces. Um, so this tool can run that app. You start with the app, you enter your parameters, you 
get a preview of what the tool is actually going to do, and then that's apparently the end of my presentation, which I'm two minutes over five minutes. So, cool. So let's talk about CNC stuff at some point. Um, I actually can run an app on this thing really quickly, but I won't. What I'll do is I'll just drive it. So this is running the app from our thing. This is all open source, it's all on GitHub, including this will be on GitHub very soon, the actual physical plans for this. So we're looking for contributors and people who are excited about CNC and for this thing, so talk to me. Let's do it. Any questions before we move on? Got a couple minutes. Oh. Oh, Spencer had his hand up. I was just going to ask if you could go ahead and etch something cool into our coffee table. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, uh, that router is actually burned out, so I can't, I can't actually. Uh, Mark. Um, I, I am, I'm looking for a source of a metal gear to be mad, printed, what, what other metal? Peak, or, well, it's to drive a, a sun, it's to drive a sunroof. Oh, okay. The um, motor's still good, but the, the, the gear broke, and the person, I, I said, well, I know some fabbing people in the area, and he said, ask them if they print metal. Or, and, and I hadn't even thought about it. I'll get, get with me, get with me uh, a little later. Uh, I can help you with what is the best tool for that, but I can also probably connect you with people who do that kind of work for hire using tools like this. That's something I didn't mention. Um, but is a big part of the whole spiel with the open uh, control of tools like this is tools are becoming less expensive, they're becoming more accessible to small shops. We need basically new software that's more savvy to having content provided to the tools and having the tools be a part of a manufacturing network. So you can imagine like if you have, rather than having like these big factories that have a big tool sitting in the corner that like do like batch up jobs and do them, you can have a fleet of these small tools and they need a way basically to communicate with a system of getting content and getting work basically from the people who have work. And so there's this whole kind of movement towards distributed manufacturing where it's a lot of small shops that are kind of rebooting as the American way of making things rather than like sending off to these giant shops in China. And we're really excited about that. But right isn't that open the door for uh, you know, intellectual property? Land, Actually, land uh, no, actually, I think that there's, um, with the advancements of, you know, everything on the web that basically like content, the, the internet has brought us a way of like selling digital content online and we want to extend the way, uh, we want to extend methods of selling digital content to these tools where if I'm a content provider, I want to sell my, you know, I've designed a gear. I know that the Mercedes, you know, whatever sunroof like craps out on you. I've designed a better gear. I want these tools to be savvy to a system where I can sell that content online to someone who wants to make those gears and then sell it to turn a profit. And so that we're hoping that that boots up a system like that that makes that available to everybody. Quick question. Like, yeah. Is there a simulator in this that you can like kind of see what you're selling? Or every time you like make a change, do you actually have to like go and do a full build? No, there's yeah, the no. So this is actually a screenshot of the part of the simulation platform, which is, is done in the browser and it's using 3JS. But you basically this is basically the tool paths of what the machine is actually gonna cut as opposed to the previous slide. So this this slide, they, they look really similar, but this slide is basically the app. This is like the preview of like me doing my design. And then this is actually the tool telling me like this is what it's gonna cut. So there's all kinds of room for simulation and verification of designs before they cut. Okay. Yeah, as a follow up to that, what kind of uh, tools feed into this thing for content creation? I mean, something other, well, that's what works is cheap. Yeah, no, it's not, and that's my point. Is there's a vacuum there? Uh, I mean, SolidWorks, of course, of course, you can use SolidWorks and, and feed that into here. But there's a real vacuum of quality CAD and CAM softwares to feed into an open source system like this. So one, we need a good CAD CAM solution for large projects, but we also need these smaller components too. Really, there's no open source. Well, every time I say no, there's no open source solution, some jackhead's gonna go, no, there's this one thing. But there's not there's not one that's like I have found to be a really compelling solution. I think that there's a lot of room for that kind of development. Okay, 
there's not a high quality. Right. So two things. Um, 3D scanning needs to improve, but they're starting yeah. to do phone scanning with, yeah. mm -hmm. with video yeah. where they Google can Tango, computationally cetera, yeah. compute the 3D models and things. And the second question is, how does that anchor to your product? Is it suction or do you bolt it down? Oh, that one is uh, by the weight of the tool. And is that, do you find that that's enough? It's enough for uh, uh, wood, plastic, and soft metal, okay. which is about all that that cutter is good for cutting anyway. You can always clamp it down if you're worried. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks. Burn that 10 seconds it takes to get to the front. And you gotta get your slides up. I got them. Hey everyone, my name is Tal Abate. I'm a UX designer here at Crenbrook. I'm gonna to talk to you about something you're probably not gonna use anytime soon, unless you're Amir. But um, <laughs> that's that's free. Oh. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna talk about Arabic monospace typefaces. If you ever wrote any code or you know HTML or any any kind of uh, programming language, you probably used uh, monospace typefaces. Um, for the longest time, um, we when I say we, I'm talking about you know you know. Arabic users, Arabic programmers, had only the Arabic version of query new shipped with Windows 3.1 and continued to get shipped with Windows 95 and 98 and so on. Um, this is what the Arabic version looks like. And I understand you probably can't read unless you're a mirror, but <clears throat> you can see uh, a problem in, in, in how much white space between the letters, how um, in, in Arabic, the letters are uh, connected uh, much like a cursive style, and this this localization of the typeface really neglects a lot of uh, aesthetic, you know, uh, guidelines that any basic Arabic typeface should uh, adhere to. Um, so th these are like the white spaces I was talking about, a little too much. Um, so I, I discovered Pragmata Pro at uh, Monospace Condensed Typeface uh, by Fabrizio. I'm not gonna even try to pronounce his last name. Shabu. Shabu. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so I, I approached the guy and I told him, hey, you know, this would be amazing uh, if, 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 would be amazing as a base for an Arabic Monospace font. And we talked, you know, exchanged emails, and we both slept on it. And a couple months later, I get this in my email. Guy went, you know, on his own. I'm super impressed by what he did. He made an Arabic version of his own typeface, and he was like, hey, check it out. You know, do you think it's any good? And, you know, it's, it's not the best, but like as a first draft, draft it's, it's super, um, Amazing as a as a first draft. Uh, so I sent him some notes, and you know we tested it with actual Latin uh, letters and like HTML, different color schemes, different um, text editors, terminals. This is them. Um, but the sad thing about Pragmata, even even though it's super uh, full featured. Uh, it has all kinds of like Hebrew, Greek, APL coding, uh, some mathematical, uh, and, and, and you know, as you can see, this is the Arabic version. Um, the sad thing about this typeface is closed source. And I chose to, you know, stop working with, with uh, Fabrizio on, on the project. Uh, I got a free typeface, though, cost a ton of money, so hey. Um, and I discovered this font thanks to this jackass. <laughs> um, Kokev is a, a typeface by Abdullah Adif, and it, it's his first typeface ever uh, 
which is super impressive. If you go to the website, he talks about, and it's open source. He talks about the process, what he wanted to do. He literally talks about how he wants it to be a little better than Courier knew the font X Um Beyond beyond like the website and his process and the fact that he released it as an open source project, I uh, really just want you to look at how beautiful it is first and just know that this is the seed for like a bigger effort. It's it's not fully finished, it's not even the first, you know, it's not 1.0, uh, but it's it's going strong, he keeps improving it, he's putting serious uh, effort into it, and um, as an Arabic speaking designer slash developer sometimes, I'm super excited about this, and I think you guys should be too. Hey, almost five minutes. Any questions? Have, yeah. Do you have a, a proportionally typed font version of what we're looking at here in Mono? Or like this typeface? Yeah, do, you know, do, is, there a, is there something we could go, okay, that looks good, but how would it how would it look if we would normally see it in a proportional proportional? I don't, I don't think there's a, a version of that. It's monospaced all the way. It's based on actually uh, Source Code Pro, which was released by Adobe <coughs> as an open source project. And I think he uses the laughing glyphs in that typeface as the, you know, English script, basically. I think we need another font because uh, a different font, a different yeah, font, but, like but a non the, the same font. The, the same Arabic text rendered in a proportional font. Oh yeah, oh I can go, go to. Uh, well, well, this is Fogelman, uh, Fogelman's uh, laptop, so I have to plug my. Oh yeah. So yeah, if you don't read Arabic, they, they look it, the it, same. They probably look <laughs> the same. Yeah, unless they're side by side. Yeah, no, no. no. Yeah, it's so, that a, the A B, you know, the A B test kind of okay. Oh yeah, I, I probably should. I literally did that an hour before the meetup. My teammates will. <laughs> we can show you after. <coughs> yeah, absolutely. So, how are Arabic uh, speakers and writers gonna find out about this font so they can take advantage of it? It's right there. Uh, there's a. This is the website. Mm -hmm. It's uh, freely avail available. Uh, you can go here. You can actually test it. Uh, it includes a full number of uh, like signs and and uh, kind of typographic. Uh, this would, I don't even know what would you, what, what would you call the uh, the skill? like. Oh, their uh, <laughs> accent marks. Accent marks, something, something like that. Yeah, much like East those. European <clears throat> scripts have those accent marks. Yeah. Any more questions? So. What are the actual, as someone who doesn't know a lot about font development, what are the degrees of freedom you have? I mean, it claims that monospace is a strong constraint. So I mean, you're suggesting, I think Arabic is like a cursive style, so that that would connect. So what kind of degrees of freedom do you have when you're developing a font? Right? Well, so much, especially if you, if you use something like OpenType, mm -hmm. where you, you can make rules based on uh, two letters being adjacent to each other. You can combine them in one single uh, character utilizing you know one character width mm -hmm. uh, and Arabic is all about that mm -hmm. you can squeeze it in a corner and it will adapt and uh, there's so much room so one yeah. monospace character might actually be two characters yeah yeah actually there are uh, certain phrases yeah uh, you know from you know religious texts and whatnot that are fully encompassed in one character. Mm -hmm. Much like emojis and whatnot, but like it's a whole. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Much like emojis. You still have all these little tricks and tricks or uh, possibilities, right? Oh, well, Unicode is my Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. They, so uh, I'm not sure if it, it covers all the. the Because uh, with the same script, you can probably use it for uh, Persian, <coughs> uh, you know, uh, probably Urdu, right? Some some pretty much any multi byte character set. Yeah, I'm sorry. sorry. Pretty much any multi byte character set. Yeah, yeah. Any Unicode uh, character that uses Arabic text, Arabic script. Okay. I'm tr I'm trying to separate what it is that you're trying to get. Are you trying to actually? I'm just showing a, a project I'm super excited about. Okay. And now is is this project uh, have a tool for being able to create 
these characters, or is it trying to be able to create the tool for creating those characters? No, no, it's, it's literally just the typex, the font. You download it, you use it, much like any other typex. Okay, so yeah. so you have content creation tools as part of this? Yeah, any text oh. editor that supports Arrow. Okay. Because hey. uh, we did an, a font editor like 1988, 1990 kind of thing, it's probably pretty solid. Yeah, but you know, not, well, the thing is, like, this is not supposed to be a comprehensive history of all mon There's a ton, there's a world of other MongSpace fonts, but a lot of them, are, especially the open source ones, are lacking in design. They're the efforts of... Well, the, 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 the largest base that I know of was actually created for X11. And, and You're talking about Airbys. Yes. Yeah, he actually uh, based a lot of uh, the material on... Uh, Time's up. Uh, he based a lot of his material on, on okay. their efforts. Okay. Dave, you have him? Uh, one more minutes. question, I'm sorry. Sure. You had more than 10 minutes. I did. Yeah. <laughs> I'm holding anything over you. I'm, I'm, I was just going to ask you night. if there's any <laughs> use cases that you're excited about that you look forward to. Well, mostly just, you know, using it within, you know, HTML. You know, like the fact that you have an Arabic typeface and an English typeface that are, you know, they look the same, it's easier to read, it's it's just, you know, a tool that I probably, you know, use every day if I was working on project projects that required Arabic text. Cool. I had a quick comment yeah. about, about that one for a minute. So there's a lot of movement now towards um, supporting more than Western-centric languages and programming. If you think about it, programming has the immediate advantage of being more accessible to English speakers. and so there's a lot of talent that's elsewhere in the world. So uh, one thing, there's a, uh, a professor, not a professor, he's, I don't know, he's like a researcher type person, Ramzi Nasser, Nasser and yeah. so he made a language called Qalb, which means heart, and it's an Arabic-based programming language. So if all the functions, all the the syntax is all in Arabic, and it all goes from right to left. Yeah. And so modern programming languages like Swift, they are Unicode compatible, and immediately off the, off the uh, like just jumping into it, you can write functions in right to left languages and it immediately switches the, the, the context of like, you know, the little out arrow that gives you the return type, that actually switches from right to left. So there's this, there's a lot of uh, more acceptance into getting into kind of non-Latin character set for programming to make it accessible to more parts of the world. So things like this make it easier for these people to have, you know, better tools and better resources when doing it. So it's nice to see, you know, the programming, you know, community becoming a little bit more international in that regard. Yeah, it's it's just a, a small element in a, a bigger chain of like tools. Like it was painful to download this and use iTerm on my MacBook Air because it, it lacked any support for Arabic text and uh, I couldn't like include cooler screenshots of this used with other typeface. But thank you, thanks so much for listening. <laughs>
um, SVG. So <clears throat> I want to write this update function, and then when I call it, I want it to draw a bar chart using these six values, one through six. So the first thing I want to do is um, it has a select function where you take, a, uh, it's like jQuery style, it's like a CSS selector. You select an element that's already in the page, and we're going to assign it to um, this bar, this variable. The next thing we're going to do, um, these calls are all chained, but I like to do it line by line. It's kind of like the, the convention when you're, when you're doing V3. Um, on this body selector, I'm going to call a select all div, and then I'm going to call dot data and pass in um, this variable data. So this select all data um, combo is called a data join, and that's where this the, kind of the magic happens. We're saying for um, every div in body, um, each of those divs is going to be mapped to an element in data. So every number in this is going to represent a div on our actual page. Um, so there's nothing drawn yet, but what we do at that point is um, we take that bars variable that we've created now, it's like this data join representation, and we call a function called enter. So that means for every um, element in our data that's not yet represented by a div, do these following commands. So for new things that um, don't have elements yet created, we're going to um, append a div. So right away we're getting these, like call it zero height div, we're gonna get six of them on the page. So we've said for these numbers one through six, create a div, um, style it, we'll do a fixed height, 20 pixels for each. And then what we can do is we can say, um, for each element, set the width, and we have a callback function. So that function D, uh, each one of those single elements for each of its uh, those divs, this is going to run and it's going to return a value. So when one gets passed in for the first div, I'm going to take it, multiply it by 20 just so we have a nice wider bar, and then set that as the uh, element's width. So we're just going to get this kind of bar chart shape now that you can see. Um, the next thing we'll do, we can set text so we can kind of see these values, see what we're representing. And what I'll try to do here is we can just kind of look and see, um, let's see, and confirm that what we're seeing on the page really is like these, these div elements that I've created. And that's a little hard to see, sorry, but we have a body tag and then we have this list of divs in the page that match what we're seeing. So, um, so at this point we have this data, we're pushing it, um, we've kind of created this set of rules, say this is how we're going to display it with DOM. Um, and then the next cool thing we can do is we can say we're going to call update initially with our first data set, and then after a second, I want to call it with a different data set and map it to the same set of divs. So if we call update a second time, right now nothing happens, so I need to change my update function a little bit. So far our bars.enter is just accounting for um, data that, like, uh, that isn't on the page yet. So on the first pass, we create all these divs. On the second pass, it says there's no new elements in the array. They're different, they're updated, but they're not new. So what we need to do is, um, I'm gonna break this apart, and so we say um, bars.enter, new, new, uh, new data will create a div and set a height, and all existing elements will set a width and set the text. So let me rerun this, and what we can see is for a second, we get the first set of data, and after that, we get a second set of data. So that's where a lot of the power with V3 comes in. You set up this initial set of rules, and then you can keep pushing different data into your update function, and the page will update uh, dynamically. Um, you don't really need to describe how the change should happen. It'll, it figures that out for you. Um, the other cool thing you can do is you can call transition, so you can say, animate between these. And so V3 automatically will calculate, it knows different properties, it knows how to transition between, We'll do that for you um, automatically, which is pretty cool. You can also set um, a duration, so you know you can make them last a little longer, or even uh, let's see, you can do like two seconds. It won't even it won't even finish the first one. But um, so you can do all this kind of fancy stuff out of the box with very little code, um, and make some pretty interesting visualizations. So real quick, I'll show a couple things I've created. This is a little demo. This is a um, HTML table that I'm generating out of a data set, and with the same data set, I'm drawing SVG. And because V3 is controlling both of these, and it has an event system I can listen to, I kind of map these different elements on the page, um, and kind of wire them up together, 
Um, but because they're both DOMs, it's easy to do. I'm not having to hook into some different API to do drawing. Um, it's, it's, it's just the same as HTML, it's really simple. Um, another thing I made was just a little map I was trying out. Um, I wanted to see what it would be like to take a D3 layer and draw it on top of some other visualization. <coughs> so I'm using a leaflet map, and these lines um, that I'm drawing on the map are actually rendered in D3. So um, you can actually do some pretty powerful visualizations on top of other drawing libraries um, just by listening to events and reacting to them. Um, and actually at Translook, we worked on a product where we, do, we did stuff like that. Um, so we can do like highly custom visualizations on top of a map, um, not, having to, not having to rely on the map uh, framework to provide this for you. So yeah, that's it. Any questions? Questions. Oh, sure. I, I, I mean, I saw this as a, um, it was a JavaScript meeting that we had back a couple months ago the first time and started playing with the examples that they have on their, the top of their web page. Yeah. And a lot of them are dynamic. Yeah. And what buffaloed me is that it appeared that the reaction time of my browser went hyperbolic. Um, that, that the, the display was actually being updated faster than normal. And somebody said this is based on um, scalable vector graphics, SVG. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. But it almost looks like the underlying system is somehow tweaked for performance for dynamic displays. This is really hot stuff, is, mm -hmm. in my opinion. OK, yeah. Yeah, it's, re it's really cool. And it's, yeah, it's easy to make those really nice transitions and things like that. And make, do displaying dynamic data on your page is where we're headed, right? Mm -hmm. You know, things moving around and interacting with the user's cursor. Well, and with those vector graphics too, it's easy to make them responsive and things like that. Because when you scale it, you don't have any aliasing or anything weird like that. So, yeah, it's really powerful. Any other questions? Yeah. How good is the SVG support? So, the SVG you're controlling a lot manually. So, there's uh, what you. Um, it's pretty much like editing raw SVG at that point, right? Okay, Creating nodes and things like that. But there's a lot of functions that help you out, um, a lot of ways to iterate. Um, there's a lot of helper functions in there, and especially even just like generating <coughs> colors and taking sets of colors and mapping between them. So you, you're starting a lot of it from scratch, but you can build up something pretty powerful pretty quickly. And there are a lot of charting libraries that do use this on the back end. Okay. So you can use kind of, yes. Uh, Will D3 be able to take take advantage of um, any GPUs, or or is it, it kind um, of it, it's no, it's just going to render it, render whatever the browser does. So you could do things. So instead of letting it trans like letting D3 transition, say a width or you, you could do that as a CSS transition, and I believe that's GPU accelerated. So you have to know where to let D3 handle transitions and where to kind of yeah uh, play to the browser's strengths. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Mike, you want to come talk about OpenCV? Uh, yeah. Awesome. I just used OpenCV uh, like a week ago. Pretty cool. Yeah. Did you email me any slides, or are you going to do your own? Uh, I don't have any slides. Okay. I'm just going to talk. No problem. Maybe I could just uh, stand back here. Do you have you have a camera going on? There is a camera. Yeah. So I'll, I'll come up to the front. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Mike, Mike and Sankey. By the way, let me compliment you on the wonderful idea that you stole from uh, Chicago, was it? <laughs> yes, um, thank you. I, I am a <laughs> tremendous advocate for open source and use and everything open as well. And uh, my business model now is on open hardware. So I'm going to try and create some things and hopefully monetize it with the hardware because it's top selling software, open software or open hardware, you know, when there's nothing there to pay for, right? So um, one of the things that I got interested in, um, sometimes last year I was looking for, and I've been playing around with uh, CompCam and cryptography with OpenCL, and, uh, but have been working with Vision at IBM for 30, 30 some years. Um, actually, the first 20 years was doing embedded systems uh, for automation and what have you, and working with things like Cognex and other vision systems that you would have, commercial vision systems would go in and, 
like a robotic system, actually might need to interact with its environment and see something in its environment. So OpenCV is computer vision, and it's a really cool open source project that allows you to do pattern recognition and basically ingest video and in real time do pattern recognition so that you can bound, do bounding boxes on objects in your environment. And I was talking to my brother as I was traveling back to Virginia with him, and these cars come up behind you. <clears throat> anybody seen the cars come up in your rear view mirror and they come so close to your bumper that you're, you're saying, I don't know whether I should move. <laughs> or should I speed up or should I move to the side this way or that way? So we were, I was saying that I could come up with a system that would be backwards looking and maybe with an ultrasonic sensor detect how close they were and give them some kind of feedback that <laughs> they shouldn't be approaching it quite as, as much. And uh, you know, maybe trip the brake lights or my brother was, uh, he's an auto mechanic, he was saying you could take a little oil put it in a, you know, a heat source and generate a little cloud of smoke. <laughs> Something that would, um, would affect their habits. So the backwards looking vision system was the first project that I was playing with. And I'm still working on it and working out the bugs. But then I've also looked at these camera systems for your, uh, you know, a doorbell or whatever. And uh, I have a number of security monitors around my house and I'm interested in uh, my business models around IOT, the internet of things. So um, I'm interested in developing little devices that could add into a security system. And OpenCV is perfect for that because it gives you the model for creating a system that in, you know, I use these Raspberry Pi, how many of you use Raspberry Pi? Okay, great, everybody. Uh, so there are little, basically, desktop Linux machines, and you can throw OpenCV on it in a heartbeat, and there's a camera that you can plug in that costs next to nothing, just like the Raspberry Pi, and automatically you're doing vision with a Raspberry Pi system that's you know well under $100. And now you can encapsulate this in you know, a nice little case, give it some kind of um, long battery life, uh, LiPo battery or whatever, and put them around the house attached to your Wi-Fi or whatever, and now you've got a security system that can not only look at your environment, but it's not gonna be tripped up by IR, you know, something chain, a car reflecting in the window, changing the heat in your house. It's gonna be actually looking at uh, the uh, visual, visible wavelength and seeing if something is actually moving around. So that's kind of the idea. Um, I, I, have, I don't have anything just yet, but I was uh, talking to the people at TriJug. They went for a, a um, December meeting on new topics, and they said, well, we're really interested. When you get, get something, we want to talk on it. And then I was at uh, Try and Bed the other month, and I saw like four or five of their topics were on OpenCV, so their populace is looking for it. So as soon as I have something that I can show you, I definitely will, you know, want to get back and do that. Yeah. Did you write, write it in Python? I did. I um, the first thing you do to play with OpenCV, you can install the library and you know, code to it in C, but you can also link to it in Python. There's a nice uh, slip interface. Send me to it. Yeah. yeah. So it's great. I've been going through Citfix. Uh, Tutorials on Py OpenCV with Python. That's what I'm, you know, following the bouncing cur cursor on the tutorials and doing, you know, hooked up to the camera, collecting images and then doing facial recognition on it. Say, hey, this is a this is a dog, this is a person, and mm -hmm. what I want to do is this is the front of a car. So I've been feeding it internet pictures of cars and what have you, and saying, yeah, it can recognize it. <laughs> it's really cool. Is the training stuff built into OpenCV? It or is. is separate? It, yet there's lots of different models for pattern recognition that are built into it, so I haven't gotten through all of them, but there's a, a training ability, and there's some really high-tech um, computational model that, you know, is performance-wise fits the Raspberry Pi and can do some good recognition. So it picks out, you give, give it a picture of people, and it will put bounding boxes around the faces, you give it a picture of cars, and there's like 20 cars in the picture from uh, you know a hillside. It can 
put bounding boxes around all the cars, and it doesn't put them around trees. It just puts them out around the car, cars. So it's really good stuff. But to what accuracy? Do you mean what's the false? Yeah. What, what are the yeah, false because, attacks because and stuff? Because even OpenCV makes false positives on various objects. Sure. Uh, and the, the way around that is, okay, uh, in general pattern recognition, uh, some people from BYU came up with an algorithm that they, okay, you have to train the net uh, for a period of time on a large number of images, but they get, uh, they can definitively tell the difference between a plane and a bird to 99.6. Right. Well, a lot of it is... You don't, you don't get that straight out of the box from OpenCV. So situationally, though, if, um, for instance, if it's a security camera in your house and you're not expecting to be people there, it's pretty much 100% in terms of detecting a person okay. there. So it depends on the environment, the noise in the environment, and are there things that look like the thing you're trying to pattern recognize, right? Okay, you're using the straight out of the box uh, facial recognition that is OpenCV? Uh, I, I tried that, and that, that works very nicely. Yeah. You know, um, So some of the people have already run the modeling that you're talking, the, the training, right. and um, gotten it to work well with certain images. And uh, one guy actually, I, I Googled the car, recognizing the cars, and somebody on the internet had modeled it for cars and did that, had, had that already done. Although he wasn't doing front views of the cars, which is what I'm looking at. So I'm trying to run training on just the front views. Um, it, it, that, that's a difficult point of view to try to recognize a car. Well, what I want is the size so that I can get the approach. So I'm going to be doing more of a tracking rather than recognition. Okay. The first thing is, okay, detect somebody's behind me, and then how close are they behind me? Because if you're trying, the only real, okay, you'd have certain grades that look the same, but the only real definitive thing that tells you uh, what type of car is, is what's the, okay, what emblem is on the car. <laughs> you don't think I'm gonna go by that because there's too many different banks and models. Okay. Yeah. And that, well, okay, that's what I'm probably trying to get at is, there's the tyranny of numbers that you don't have. Right, right. So, so Intel, Intel has library, libraries of patterns that they've gone through the process, and you can use as long as it's not commercial. If, you, if there's something that you wanted to, uh, a library, a recognition pattern library, are you gonna have to go through the same uh, effort that Intel went through, or have you looked at that as a, you know, what's, what would it cost you to license? I haven't looked at databases and stuff. And, and really, I like just like the um, Arabic font, I'd much rather have an open source solution than license somebody else's solution because of the expense involved. One more question. Uh, yeah. Is OpenCV only training for 2D images or can you feed other data into it? Um, from what I've seen, it's 2D. It's, it's like you can take the individual JPEGs out of a video screen. So it'll run, it'll do stream processing, but I think it dices it. So yeah, I think it's uh, just like JPEGs. Frame by frame basis. Frame by frame. Thanks, Mike. <laughs>
and an easy way to develop web apps really easily and just get it started without having to understand HTML or JavaScript. You, you could, you totally could have make it all flexible, but you don't have to, and it's, um, it's to use the Shiny environment uh, that is produced by RStudio. I don't know if you've heard of it, but. Um, so this is, so this is connected to, so this is running on our um, company server. It's a little slow because I'm connected to the VPN right now, but so this is the interface that people, our collaborators in Ireland and other sites around the um, company are using to figure out, are we doing, are we passing stuff for this sort of thing? So um, using R, this is all R, and uh, it, it's connecting to our LIMS, uh, Library Information Management System, connecting to uh, SQL, Postgres, SQL databases, connecting all the data that are automatically pulling stuff off the sequencer and off like um, Illumina is this huge sequencing company, their um, servers, space space servers. And so basically now they can go, okay, well, this is our latest run. It failed, okay, move on, next. So let's see, this, did this one fail? Um, please stop me if you have any questions too. So, um, so this is, uh, we're testing a lot of sequencing runs to see if um, this product that we're gonna market soon is gonna pass these requirements. So this one passed, um, and you can tell, so this is, the, this is stuff we're pulling directly automatically from the limb system. You can tell of a scientist, like, what are the conditions that went into that sequencing run and how do we replicate that? Um, so for the um, scientists, they like to look at certain QC metrics. And let's say, there's a bunch of stuff, pick some random stuff. And so what makes this easy is that all this stuff is just all R coding. Like, all these drop down menus, all this stuff is pulling all from like R data frames. And this is um, just the ggplot package. Um, like if you had made standard uh, R plots, you could just put any plot that you could make in R into this app. And um, all our data is coming off like uh, in science, we have these 384 well plates. So we have, we're producing a lot of data on this sort of format. And so it's, we've been having spatial issues. So they've been liking to look at you know this sort of um, format. And of course there's line charts. So here, it's very similar, so this is the same table, but here they can compare, um, it's a little slow, but they can compare multiple runs to see like um, what's, how's it going? <laughs> okay, so this is just the first draft of this app. Uh, we're in the process of kind of just making things faster. Um, on the back end, the pipeline is using Airflow, that's that Airbnb developed to like automatically like run through all the processes. Um, so this is what the scientists are seeing. They can kind of take a look at other plots that we typically um, would have generated for them automatically without me having to actually like type R code and send on a PDF report. Um, so if you just click on it, it's, you can just see all the, they can see all the stuff that com comparison of like, okay, well, this is better than this one, and et cetera. Okay, so it's really easy. So this is the, um, this is the Shiny page. And basically, if you don't R, all you need is two files. You need a UI.R, which just means user interface. And um, basically, this just sets, if you want a checkbox, you just go checkbox, and you give an ID, that'll connect the thing. Um, you have a plot thing, it's like super easy. And then the other thing, that, like the guts of the stuff that you know, we do all the like statistical calculation, the plotting, will be in server.R. So this is the server interface. And so you have an input output and here you just basically, um, this is where you produce the code that returns it back to the UI.R. So let's say for instance, so here, if you wanna change the number of bins in histogram, that changes. So that is here. So you have the end breaks and then you have choices and it's like super easy like if you were just doing HTML. And that ID is returned into here in this uh, histogram, the usual R histogram code, and that becomes just uh, as an input in there, and that changes automatically. So, would you, would you mind hitting Control Plus a couple times? Sure. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Am I better? Okay. Thanks. That's what that is. Yeah. And so it's pretty responsive. You can have you know whatever flexibility, in whatever you want to show. Uh, for the user scientists or whoever you are trying to give results and, and data back for. Yeah. So there's a little more, um, you can, if you if you know CSS, cascading style sheets, you can make it way more complicated. There, you can use bootstrap themes to make it pretty and put logos and all that stuff. So it, it can be as easy as you want it to just get some something quick or as complicated as, as like, um, as um, kind of um, appropriate for whatever you need to do. 
How big are the data sets that we're talking about? Oh, the ones here? Um, so these are just 96 points per row here. So it's not too big for this one. Okay, uh, I'm just trying to get, all this computation is being, is being done, I'm assuming, in real time? Yes, so the database only stores like the raw data and like the summary statistics and all that stuff so is just, but it's all very simple stats yeah, right now. Okay. There's no uh, modeling or anything involved. That basic, might, basic size of, uh, you're saying 96 rows, what does that? Just 96 observations per row. Oh, uh, yeah. per row. Oh, yeah. Per row. Okay. Yeah. Right now. So each one of those, each one of those blue bars represents a row or is it a represents row. the 300, the 300 uh, buckets, 380 buckets uh, would be equal to 380 rows. Uh, with 96, with 96, uh, 96. data. So one, this one would be this plate here, and that's just 96 for now. We might fill up the whole plate with 384. But it's 96 now. Just 96 now, yeah. Okay. We might have more like data mining and um, other stuff later, but for now it's just like simple, like just get stuff out there for people. And this is, was pretty easy, like it took us like a week to make this. And BD's hosting their own shiny server? Yes. Okay. And this is RX running on the server. Yeah. So it's very easy. You just install. They have a they have a server version. I think if you go to download somewhere, they just have a they have a you, there's the library shiny package, and then there's the server that you install in the server and nodes. And it's easy. I com I commit it into that. Um, I commit code, and then I just there has a slash server folder that you just dump it in there, and it'll automatically appear on uh, on the port thirty eight thirty eight or whatever one you want. My previous job was at a company that got acquired by Illumina. Ah. It's funny. Also, Ryan works there. Which, which company? Uh, Liquid Logic. Okay. It's funny to hear about the base space. Base space. <laughs> That's all we heard about. Base space. <laughs> Future. Well, I was going to give a talk, so I'll go ahead. Even there, there's a couple more people, so I'm not last. I'll just throw myself in the mix. <clears throat> you sort of got a preview already from Ryan's talk. Ryan's the art on the wall. Trying to steal your thunder, if that's what it is. So this guy I follow on Twitter, I don't really know him in person, but he's somewhere in Europe. Um, he started plotting all these, uh, he started posting all these plotter images on Twitter, and I was like, what is this thing? And I, I was really curious. So basically I went and bought one. And it's, uh, it's Arduino based, and it comes as this kit. Um, a whole bunch of aluminum parts and uh, all kinds of huge box of parts. And first thing I did was assemble it, which took me more than one day. I, didn't, I couldn't do it in one stretch, but it took about six hours total, I think. I didn't time it, but that's what it felt like. Um, it's based on the Arduino Uno. And this is my first foray into the Arduino world. Um, uh, it came with two stepper motors to move. So basically, it draws with a pin. You just put a, like a big regular ballpoint or belt fit pin inside of it, and you can draw with it. So the two stepper motors move with the pin in the X and Y axes. Uh, there's four limit switches to detect when the motors hit the end of travel. Um, there's a servo motor to move the pin up and down. Um, and that's pretty much it, hardware-wise. Um, they can draw about a little over a foot by 15 inches. And so far I've only used ballpoint pens, but you could probably put a pencil or even a paintbrush in there. And it was $2.99 on Amazon. So the firmware, it's all written in C, um, and it's all open source, which is great because it's kind of crappy. 
if I had to go in there and edit it myself. <laughs> um, if it was closed, I probably wouldn't even be talking about this thing right now. Um, uh, it uses G-code, which Ryan gave you a primer on, and but it only supports a few G-codes. Um, G-code is a huge standard, and you can do arcs and well, even more than like all kinds of manufacturing and stuff. Um, but this basically supports three codes: one to home it, find the home position; uh, another code to move to a certain x y coordinate, and a code to set the pin position, which is an angle between zero and 180. There's really no motion planning, so most CNC tools, you tell it where you're going to go, and it looks at the next several points and figures out how how much it can accelerate um, to to kind of move through the curve gracefully. This does none of that. Um, you basically send it one point at a time, and it just linearly interpolates there and stops. <laughs> like that. But like I said, fortunately it's open source, so we can hack it. And then it came with software that runs on the PC. Uh, it actually comes with two software packages, which is sort of confusing. One is cross-platform. It's written in Python with Qt. It's called MDraw. And that, the other one is Windows only, and it's closed source. It's called Binbox. Um, and that one I haven't even used. Um, but MDraw basically lets you load an SVG file, and it will draw it with water. And that's pretty much it. You can, you can reposition it and scale it, but that's pretty much all that software does. So I used that like the first day just to get my feet wet, but after that it was time to write some code. So I, and I use Python, um, and you communicate with it over the serial port, um, and you basically open the serial port and you just send text commands, G-code, and you wait, for a, you wait for it to respond, okay, I'm done with that command, let's go to the next command. And really, it's simple, if you can generate a list of 2D points, you can plot something. You just send it the XY coordinates, it'll go there, and you just tell it when to move the pin up and down. And now all I have are some examples. Um, so here's a dragon curve, which is a fractal. This was one of my first tests. I wanted to kind of see how precise it was. They claim 0.1 millimeter accuracy. Um, and I, I didn't get that at first. I had to like tighten the drive belts on the motors and fiddle with the, me the mechanism that holds the pin. I added some washers in there to make it have less uh, you know, shake. Um, and it got pretty good. Here I fitted a US shape file and just drew the United States. Um, this is from like electric field mine. And basically what I have done so far is taken a lot of the code I've written in the past to do like some of this artwork um, and re reworked it to go in the plotter. Um, but I've also done some new stuff like this one, which is up there. Um, I've been having a lot of fun with it. Highly recommend it. Um, maybe even for if you have older kids, like teenagers, it'd probably be great. Not just assembling it and learning the hardware, but also the learning the software. What, um, what's the performance of it? Um, how long does it take to make a complex drawing? It can take. So this one here probably took about three hours. Okay. Uh, I mean, if you. You can, and I've hacked the firmware a bit to make it drive, you know, drive the motors faster, but <laughs> the, the, you don't get as good results because the pen can't lay down ink that fast, or or it's just kind of stuttering on the paper or something like that. So you don't want to go too fast, really. So it just it really depends on the complexity of what you're drawing. If you're doing a simple line drawing, it. Uh, but even the I think this one took like 20 minutes. So there's kind of a lot of detail there. Um, what sort of optimization have you done in terms of draw order, et cetera? Yeah, so when you initially generate a drawing like this, say this one, you know, you have all this, these paths you want to draw, but I had to spend some time in optimizing the drawing order. And basically, you don't want to draw a little line here and then move across the paper and draw something here and then move over here and draw something there. You want to kind of optimize that ordering. <coughs> Most of my drawings, I just do a greedy optimization where I, I draw a path and then I pick the next path that is nearest it that I haven't drawn yet and draw that one. And I'll also possibly reverse the path 
to draw it the other direction. Um, I've tried some other stuff that's try to find like a global, like max, you know, optimal solution to that, but usually the greedy one is good enough. The big furry circle, like, is that is that must you start in the middle and draw out, or yeah? Well, you know, you know when I drew, when the plotter drew it, it didn't draw it that way. Right, sure. But, but your, your, your ultimate solution was that like a radiating sort of thing, or after like starting out path? after after your after planning out the path. Yeah, no, it was it was hanging around the perimeter for a while for some reason. Oh. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't necessarily I don't necessarily understand how it. It probably looked good in the time lapse. Like I've taken time you lapses. Move, move the pen out of the way and then draw some more and with your time lapse. Yeah, there's actually check out my Twitter. There's it's full of this stuff right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> Mark, yeah. Um, is the the pen up down strictly binary? Strictly binary, or do you have? It's an angle. So, the servo works in combination with a rubber band. So, <laughs> so the servo lifts the pin up off the paper, but to to draw the pin, the servo goes down to off this rocker arm that it lifts up, and then the rubber band is what pulls the other end of that rocker arm to apply pressure to the paper. Um, so you can't get real precise with that angle. Like I've tried, you know, if you're just touching the paper over here and you move over here, it might be like not drawing anymore. Tolerances just aren't good for that. Have you? Because I was thinking, if you had a, a, a soft tip, a soft tip marker or a, or, or a quasi brush, I've seen some. I bought one and I haven't tried it yet. I permanent should. markers that are actually brush, very brush-like. Uh, if, if that was possible. But yeah, you can set an angle, and, but it's only it's an integer in degrees, so that you don't have a whole lot of like play with that. Yeah. Okay. And the other one, have you have you tried using different <coughs> kinds of pens, like a Kohinoor, really ultra fine pen? Have you? Yeah. What what works best? The I, what I've mostly been using are these fancy felt tip style pens that are like 0.5 millimeter. I tried the really super fine one, was like 0.1 millimeter, and it just it broke it right away. <laughs> <laughs> Slamming it down on the paper and dragging it. Can you control the speed of the servo for for press the pressure? I haven't seen that in the API anywhere. No. So I mean, it's super cool and, and it's really fun to watch and stuff like that. Have you like actually gotten a result that you think is noticeably different than just like a printer? I I don't blame you for asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> and essentially, that's what printers do. But <laughs> no, right? No. Well, you can look at these. I have a few hanging here in the office, and you can look at them up close. And yeah. I think there's a lot more to it. And okay. you can see some of them look kind of hand drawn. Um, I think there's, I think that there's value beyond just. Plus, there, they're bigger than a regular home printer would do. But right. yeah, my time is up. But we, I'll take a little more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have one of these things. Oh yeah. Yeah. And uh, same brain and everything. Same brain and everything. Uh, if, if you're interested in trying to speed up the uh, the ink, there's a company in Washington, uh, in the Seattle area, that actually makes a, an, an adapter that can go to uh, speed up your your ink. Uh, the other thing that's kind of useful, we, we were talking about application. One of the best applications for these things is actually taking cheap circuit boards uh, and being able to do the etching for these things. And, and it actually, that's what I've adapted mine for. Also, also, um, wow, that's cool. Also writing on things that are not paper. Yeah. Right, yes. Because you can exactly. put it on exactly. Canva style. Yeah, mirror. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where's it right now? We're right. Old shirt now. <laughs> See, Elaine, why don't you come up? I saw a lot of faces looking around. Um, that canvas, as well as that canvas, and anything in a nice black frame, and that giant map of the United States in the hallway, those are all uh, works of Fogel art, in case you're wondering. <laughs> I work here at Translook. I 
used to work at Google for breakfast. Um, I'm also a trained group statistician, and I also use R. Um, so France is good. It's good segue. Maybe a backward segue, actually. That's what I'm going to talk about. Um, so I wanted to kind of double down on the open source idea. So R is open source, and R Studio with the EIDE system that has now evolved as open source. Um, and what I want to talk about is reproducible research or reproducible analysis, which kind of makes the whole analysis process in a way open source. Um, so in R and nicely supported by R Studio, which is not the only way to use R, it's just mostly the best way right now. Um, there's R flavored markdown, much like other markdowns. And one of the really cool things that that allows you to do is embed R code in documents. And this has been possible for quite a while with something called Sweep and LaTeX, but it's now like so much less annoying. Um, so Francis and I used to do it the hard way. Now it's just uh, so. So what it is is really like writing your R code and then annotating it and adding a few little things and then getting a document that generates from the data and, and the code that you get. So I wrote something to demonstrate this. So these, these were written in, uh, in RMD class. So this is our studio that you're looking at. There's a lot of other RMDs in some ways. Um, Do you need this bigger at all? Uh, And the details of the code maybe are not pretty good. So the point is that this is this is an RMD file, so this is our markdown. There's a few little things at the top that create the title. Um, and then these these things here are our trunks, which is actually code. Um, and this is just setting some options that will affect how the document is created. And so then I'm just writing plain text for the, the text in the document and, and creating sections, and they have in R code that does whatever you want R code to do, um, and um, so those are those are chunks of code. And the other way to do this is to have inline R code, where you have things actually like inserted as part of the sentence that are generated by the code. So once I've created this, um, I can knit it, which combines the R and everything else, and create the document. It runs through stuff. <coughs> And then here's a, this is like a preview um, of the document. I can look at it in the browser also. It's just HTML. So this is uh, what I wrote here is something that takes in a bunch of data for any kind of race where you have a pace and uh, records of all different results in gender and age, and then does some analysis about results by gender and age. Um, and so in this document, I'm describing kind of the steps of the analysis, which is one of the important aspects of this, is that people do analysis. And even if they do analysis with open source tools, you don't necessarily know what they did. Um, and it's been historically kind of hard to share what you did in a way that people could alter it and see exactly what you did and get into all the nitty gritty details of what you did with the data um, that matter. And there's some, been some very high profile problems, most notably at Duke, um, of people making analysis mistakes that then cause all kinds of downstream problems in clinical trials and things because people couldn't investigate and reproduce the analyses they were doing. And so sharing analysis and being able to alter other people's analysis is an important reason for, for these kinds of um, documents to exist, but also just knowing what you did later and being able to regenerate what you did slightly differently is really important. So I'll show how that works. So I'm just going through the steps here in this document in maybe more detail than you would do in a final report. And the nice thing about this is you can put these sections in and then you can make versions of this where you've like commented some sections out for people who don't want this much detail. Uh, so this is the document without the code. So you can see I'm showing some examples of the data to show what calculations I'm doing and then making some graphs. But the kind of more interesting thing is that I can easily put this um, by changing this echo parameter and generate the same thing from the same data that has the code included. So whether or not you want to show your actual code or you know, it depends on your audience and, and what you're trying to do. 
But in this case, you can see this is where I write in my data so you can see exactly where the dead file is, which is nice if you're sharing with people within a collaborative group. Um, and then it shows a little bit of what the initial data looks like, and it's included in the data set. And then here where I start doing calculations looking at like um, within age and gender groups, what were people's ranks and what percentile were they in inside those groups, and just basically deriving things that I need to do more interesting graphs and analysis, you can see exactly how um, that's happening. So these are my age groups, and this is, I don't know how many people here have seen R before, and R's been around for quite a while, and there's kind of a new R, it's called the Adlyverse, it's the old R is still better, but this, the new R is better. Um, and it's much easier to read and understand than if you don't really know R. So in my opinion, someone who does SQL and stuff like that could look at this code and, and basically know what's going on here and figure things out with themselves um, without learning a little bit more. So they're just grouping by things and summarizing things and, create, and calculating means and things like that. And you can see in the document exactly how that's happening. And then see the result of those calculations. Um, and then see also for the graphs exactly how they're being created. Um, these plots that the, the Francis was showing. And so there, there's a bunch of different things in here. So was, this is a race, uh, this is an obstacle race, and this is looking at the effect of gender and how much lower women are um, than men in this race and like how that compares across um, the span of people who finished first versus the people who finished last. You can see there's a clear gender gap. Um, and then <coughs> not a clear age gap, which is very interesting. And I did a little more work looking specifically at how big the gender gap is. So one of the cool things about having this in code, the whole document in code, um, including the parts where I had that in line, uh, so that it was accessible. So I just included one example of that here where I had accounts of men and women for that and generated by R as is the, the name of the event, which was in the data set itself, not So one thing that I've heard recently that's interesting is that the gap in gender uh, essentially goes away in ultra running events, like crazy long events, like 50 miles, 100 miles, uh, because of estrogen and a bunch of other cool biological things. So, so I thought now that I have that, I can, I was thinking that just before I came here, I could go look for some ultra data and see if that's actually the case. Um, so I pulled a different data set that just has those same kind of things in it, just gender, age, the times. Um, and I can now run this exact same analysis basically by just changing the input file and get that same set of plots and results and tables for that uh, set of first results. And um, some of them look quite different because, as it turns out, not huge numbers of people run ultramarathons with this. <laughs> it's much smaller. Uh, I guess that makes sense. Um, so if I go down and look at that same gender graph, it's much um, less smooth for some reason. It's a huge increase here, looking at the times as you as you make the cumulative distribution. But you can see, in fact, there is basically no gender gap. So that's kind of a nice way to test the hypothesis. Um, nobody started the timer, so I don't know how long. It's been. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is a very simple example of this, and some of the, the nice things that you can do to extend this in more complicated cases are to basically integrate some of the things that Francis showed, and there's this kind of continuum between this, um, which is just marked down, and interactive document which embeds little shiny components, so if you wanted somebody to be able to like choose from a drop down or something and, and have some interactive things, to basically taking the same code and modifying it somewhat to make a shiny app that's like a little web app. So it allows you to leverage your R code and, and make it much more useful and, and much easier for other people to see and read um, and for you to reuse the same piece of web code. So last year, the R meetup had a presentation on R Markdown and I, I liked the presentation and I, I learned a lot. And what I took from it is it looks an awful lot like what Markdown is doing is akin to what the Jupyter or the IPython notebook was doing in terms of wrapping the documentation into the code and the code into the documentation. And I took away from the Markdown presentation that you don't just have to be doing R, you could have other pieces of code in there as the interpreter block and that the documentation portion of it still works with it, right? 
Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you've tried this or anything with Python branches. I know there's some These separate things going on that I don't quite understand. understand. Or with the Jupyter Notebook. Yeah, so yeah, yeah so the, there are definitely things that are starting to integrate. And I've used Python Notebooks and Kino and R, and I've run Python scripts, like command line style, within my R code, but not in a way that would be fully integrated like you're talking about. But I think like that it's not possible. One thing in my experience that's different between this and an Python Notebook, at least the way that I've them is that you can generate this all at once, which gives you a certain amount of assurance that everything happens in the order that it should, whereas in a Python notebook you can kind of run this part, go run this part, and then mess something up and go here, and then you're not actually you sure. You can what's tell happening. it to play the notebook, and right. then it's you kind of finish. akin to what. So yeah. perhaps that is how but you should is, do it. In my experience, not. that's not necessarily how I do it. This is static once it's been, like you squirt this out, and then it's. Right. And then it been, it's been done, whereas yeah. the IPython notebook is like communicating with the server that's running right. Python live. Yeah, so. right. So once you start putting interactive components in, you move towards that requirement where you have to people have to have more things in place to generate it, or you have to have server. As as this is, it's just HTML, or you choose there's a um, PDF option which generates the path basically to the LaTeX, or if you must, there's Word. So you can use the same code and generate all of this, and then you have you know PDFs. That it's a little bit different. In, in these systems, like there's the iPython notebook, and there's this, and I'm sure there's like other this whole kind of constellation of these sort of things. Is there any trend towards collaboration and sharing of this stuff? Like I could imagine like you publishing this and then somebody wanting to be like, oh, I'll fork that and make a change. Like are there any systems in place or coming in place where you can host all these things and then Fork and share and do you know like GitHub style where you, right. you know, I mean, oh here's some source code I'm gonna fork it and make a change and either publish it myself or, or reincorporate. Does this provide any GitHub sharing capabilities? Is, there's, I don't see any reason that GitHub isn't bad. That's so, yeah. Right. So people put stuff on GitHub. Um, Coursera courses are are free for documentation and they share the lecture and people can adapt the lecture and everything else. Jupyter notebook is encapsulated in Markdown. And then, um, so there's our presentations where you can like publish this to their site, and I assume you can probably download the code that way as well. We should apply this uh, and see if there's a gender gap in lightning fluctuation. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have enough data in this room. <laughs> the larger <laughs> That's true. That's true. We get our data points. If so you can find a large point. enough setting, even that, it's let's get gender balance. <laughs> That's everyone who signed up. Anyone else want to give a talk? You don't have to be on the list. And you can wing it if you want. You don't need slides. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, you don't have to leave right away. So if you, if you saw something cool, let's talk. There's still beer. There's still beer. <laughs> There's a couple slices of pizza. That's it. Yeah. Thank you.